right, welcome back. So today we'll conclude our discussion of sorting, um, which is something that's consumed us over the past couple of classes. We're going to review, we did this sort of quickly at the end of class on Monday, but we're gonna review merge sort runtime. And then we're going to finish by looking at an algorithm that is um, interesting. Um, it's a well-known sorting algorithm. Um, it's fun to implement. It's fun to talk about because it has very interesting behavior. Um, it has good behavior in certain cases and poor behavior in other cases. And so unlike merge sort, which is sort of like the, you know, uh, predictable, uh, you know, the steady predictable algorithm in the sorting space, as we'll review in a minute, uh, quick sort can work really well, or depending on the inputs you give it, it can work very poorly, right? So that'll give us a little bit more of a chance to, to exercise our, you know, algorithm analysis muscles on something that actually has a large amount of input dependence. And we'll think a little bit about what some of the sort of uh, canonical sort of quarter cases are that cause quick sort to perform poorly. After that point, we'll go through kind of our sorting algorithms, lay out everything. We'll talk about a couple of other properties that we sometimes like sorting algorithms to have, and that'll be it. Okay, so let's re start by reviewing merge sort. So we had implemented merge sort together last time. You guys will have another chance to do that on the homework this week in a little bit of a different context. So we had done the merge step, which was really all the work. We did uh, extended that to actually provide a recursive sorting function. And then we wanted to think about runtime. And this is a case where, you know, it's a little bit trickier. It's not just one loop or two nested loops or something like that. There's actually a function, there's a recursive algorithm here. And so we need to think about, you know, how many times is the recursive function going to get called? And so here's an example of doing this analysis for an array of a certain size. So I'm gonna pick eight. That's a size that's chosen, of course, to make this example work out nicely. Now let's just think about what happens here. So after we get to the point when we reach the base case and we actually start merging. So remember the first, like many recursive algorithms we've looked at, the ones we run on trees, the first thing the recursive algorithm does is get all the way to the bottom. So it keeps breaking the problem into smaller and smaller pieces until it finally gets to a problem that it can't make any smaller. And in the case of merge sort, in the case of a tree, that was typically an empty tree or a single node. In the case of an array, that's an empty array or an array with one value. So array with one value is already sorted. And so the first merge step we do is actually at the very bottom, right? So we took an array of size eight, we divided it into two arrays of size four, we took those arrays of size four and divided them into two arrays of size two, we took those arrays of size two and divided them into two arrays of size one, and now total we've got eight arrays of size one and we're gonna start to put things back together, all right? So our first merge takes eight arrays of size one, merges them in pairs into four arrays of size two, okay? So here's the tricky thing. So remember, merge is O n and the size of the resulting array. So each one of these merges between four, each one of the merges is producing an array with two items. So I'm doing four merges of O n where n is two, and that's equivalent to one O n step where n is eight, okay? So this takes O n and the size of the original array, right? I'm doing a lot of merges, but they're all small, okay? Now, what I have is four arrays of size two that are all sorted that I need to merge back together. Okay, so my second merge, I'm working, I'm taking my solutions to these smaller problems and combining them together into a solution to the bigger problem. So now I've got four arrays of size two, and I'm gonna merge them together, I'm gonna merge them in pairs into two arrays of size four. So again, I have two merges where n is four, which is equivalent to one step where n is eight, O n. Okay, so I've got another O n step. In my final step, I take those two arrays of size four, merge them together into one array of size eight. So that's clearly one merge of size O n where n is eight. So every step, every level of the algorithm takes O n. And so the question only becomes, how many levels is it gonna take? And the idea here is that if I take an array of any size, if I take an array of size n, and I break it in half, 
at each step. This number of levels that it's gonna take to get to arrays that are size one or zero is log n, where it's log base two of n, okay? Think about it, as we go up, the log, log is the, you know, again, this is sometimes hard for people to think about, but log is the inverse of an exponential, right? So as we, as we combine things together, so when we get all the way to the bottom, we have arrays of size one. That's true no matter how big the array is. And then we have arrays of size two, and then four, and then eight, and then 16, and then 32, and then 64. And eventually, I'm doubling in every step. So eventually, that n is gonna get to be bigger than the array that I started with, at which, at which point I'm done. So this doubles on the way up, so the number of doublings that it takes to reach a particular value of n is log n. So I've got log n steps. Every step takes O n because it's either one big merge of size O n or a bunch of smaller merges, but it always works out to be O n. So I've got log n levels. Each level takes O n. I get O n log n. Where again, the logarithm here is base two. Any questions about this now? This is, you know, again, this is kind of tricky, right? So the, the binary search algorithm you guys worked on yesterday in lab, right? That was the case where that's a O log n algorithm, right? Again, think about it from the bottom up, right? So when you start, it's a recursive search algorithm. It keeps making the array smaller and smaller. It says, I don't know where the value is in array of size n, but it'll be easier to find if I look for it in array of size n over two. And I keep doing that until I get an array with one item, at which point I say, okay, I, I, now I've gotta be able to find it. It's either in here or it's not. When I work my way back up, every time I go up a level, I start with an array, I start out having search an array with one element, and then I have search an array with two elements, and then four, and then eight, and then 16. Again, I'm doubling on the way up. So this, this property of either the problem doubling or the problem getting twice as, half as, half the size produces this log n behavior. It was log n for search because you only had to do one thing every time. It's n log n for sorting because I have n steps that I have to do at every level of my tree. All right, so here's maybe another way to think about it. You know, I start with these eight arrays here that are totally unsorted. Now I've got four arrays that are sorted, now that are size two, now I've got two arrays that are sorted of size four, and now I've got one big array. So again, three levels here, which is log n base two of eight. Okay, any questions on merge sort runtime? Makes sense to everybody. Okay, so it's important because we're about to see another algorithm that performs similarly, um, although there's some more variation. Okay, so let's think about this. And unfortunately, I don't have the implementation up here. So remember, whenever we think about, you know, algorithm analysis, and this is true forever, this is not just true in this class, whenever you think about how an algorithm performs, you always want to think about, you know, how bad can it get? You also wanna think about, oh, in what cases is it gonna do well, right? But how bad can it get? Okay, so for time, one of the nice things about merge sort is that it doesn't care, okay? It's n log n in the best case, it's n log n in the average case, it's n log n in the worst case. It is always n log n. And if you go back and look at our implementation from last time, the reason is there's no step at which point uh, merge sort is actually you know, branching based on the data that's in the array. You know, it says, I don't know, the data might already be sorted. Even if you give me a sorted array, I'm still gonna break it into two arrays that are half the size and break those into two arrays. It does the same thing every single time, right? So that's nice, okay? It's predictable. You don't have to worry about it performing badly. Now, here's the other concern, though, with merge sort, and this sort of motivates our next sorting algorithm, is that merge sort actually needs a lot of space. So again, I wish I, I wish I had the implementation from last time, but that merge, remember, every time we do a merge, we create a new array. So during the merge, I have my original arrays, right? And then I also have to create a new array that I'm merging the items into. Now it turns out that there's some clever things that you can do here to reduce the amount of space that merge sort needs, but in general, merge sort always needs this temporary array. So I'm taking, I've got my two original arrays that are total size n, and I need to create a new array of size n to work with them, 
right? So that I have somewhere to put the values as I'm pulling them out of those original arrays, okay? So as the algorithm is running, it needs a temporary, essentially it always needs a temporary array of size n. Um, and, and this can be a problem. Again, think about it. If you're trying to merge, like, billions of records, trillions of records, um, this, this is something that's done, right? I mean, again, think about all the data that, you know, Google has collected about us, or Facebook, or Amazon, or whatever. I mean, they have, and, and, and this is actually child's play compared with, if you think about things like uh, biological data, like your genome, massive amount of data, right? Linear data, you know? Working through that, I mean, you can, you can definitely, it's feasible to have to sort trillions or maybe even whatever the next number past trillions of records is. If you go back and look at the sorting benchmark competition, they have categories that involve sorting massive data sets. And so it's hard to just find space to store that data set, and now you're saying, to run my sorting algorithm, you need to take all that space and double it. So if you, if it took, you know, two terabytes to store the data, I need two ter more terabytes to sort, right? In many cases, this is a non-starter, right? This really makes, uh, it's a serious weakness with merge sorting. Okay. So now, let's look at the, our, our final algorithm, right? Um, and both merge sort and quick sort are, are both sort of examples, and a lot of recursive algorithms fall into this category, of a technique that we call, uh, sometimes referred to as divide and conquer. Okay, so divide and conquer algorithm, you know, this really sort of, uh, rep you know, describes the recursive algorithms that we've already been writing. The idea behind divide and conquer is to figure out how to make a problem smaller so that eventually I make solutions that are so simple they can be solved directly, right? And then it says the solutions of the sum problems are then combined to give a solution to the original problem. That's what we've been doing all along, right? You hear this a lot in computer science because it's a great problem solving technique. Right? I take a big problem, and if I can make it smaller, and smaller and smaller, eventually I make it into small enough problems that are easy to solve. Okay? So here's how quicksort's going to work. All right? So here's my unsorted away. Away. Array. Here's my unsorted array. In each step, here's what quicksort does. It, it tries to make the problem small. It does this in a little bit of a different way than merge sort. So merge sort, we exploited the fact that we can merge arrays together in O n time. In quick sort, what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, I've got this big unsorted array. And I don't know how to sort the whole thing, but here's what I can do. I can cut the array into two pieces, where all the values that are smaller than a certain value are in one part, and all the values that are larger than that value are in another part, okay? So those two subarrays are still unsorted, but now I went from having a sorted array of size n to having two sorted arrays that are both small, okay? And maybe if I keep doing this, eventually I can end up with small sorted arrays, right? All right, so let's see how this works in practice. So I take a value that's called the pivot, and choosing the pivot value turns, to have a, turns out to have a big effect on how well quick sort performs. All right, so I'm gonna pick a pivot, and then I'm gonna move, again, I'm gonna divide the array into two parts, values that are smaller than the pivot and values that are greater than or equal to the pivot. So I want the pivot to be in between. I don't care where the rest of the values end up. That's not important, right? I'm not sorting the array in one step. I'm just dividing the array into values that are smaller than the pivot and values that are larger than the pivot. All right, so let's say I pick the pivot value eight, right? You, if I look through the array, I have one, I think I only have one value here, 11, that's bigger than the pivot. Um, and so when I'm done with a step of quick sort, here's what the array is gonna look like. So I'm gonna modify the array so that eight is now in the, it turns out eight is actually in the exactly right spot, all these values to the left are smaller than eight, and this value to the right is larger than eight. So I haven't sorted the array, right? This whole part over here is not sorted. These two values are sorted, but this whole part over here is not sorted, but I've created a smaller problem to solve, 
right? So I'm dividing and conquering. So what do you think we do next? Well, now I have smaller problems, and now I can basically just restart the algorithm on the smaller arrays. Note that in each step of quickstore, I think this is important to point out, the pivot value ends up in the right spot. So eight will never move again. Eight is in the right place in the array. None of the pivot value is the only value that ends up in the right spot. All the other values, they might end up at the right spot, they might not, but the pivot value is guaranteed to be put into the right place, okay? But I started off with an array of size eight to sort. Now I've got an array of size six and an array of size one. Well, my array of size one is easy, it's already sorted. But for my array of size six, I don't know what to do. And so I'm gonna do the same thing I just did. I'm gonna pick a pivot value, in this example, I'm choosing the first value in the array as the pivot. There are multiple ways to pick a pivot value, and the performance of quicksort is really dependent on how you choose the pivot value. We'll come back and talk about that in a few minutes. But for now, we're just, for simplicity's sake, I'm choosing the first value. All right, so I'm picking five as my pivot value, and now, again, I'm going to reorder the array so that values that are smaller than five end up on the left, and any values that are larger or equal to five end up on the right. So again, now the array is still not sorted, but I've got smaller problems to solve. And so now I've got an array of size three and an array of size two to sort, and I'm just gonna continue this process. I pick the first value in each subarray, I pivot the subarray around that value, and then now it turns out I'm done. Okay. Any questions about this? Quicksort is subtle. I mean, I'll, I'll be happy to stand here and go over this example. I mean, I don't expect you guys to. I think quicksort it takes a little while longer than merge sort to wrap your brain around. It's one of the reasons we're talking about it now after we've seen some of these other algorithms. Okay. We'll implement it in a sec. Right. So now let's look at a single step of the partition, because again, when we think about runtime, we're going to have to think both how many steps does it take, and how long does each, you know, so how many levels in the algorithm and how long does each level take, right? So essentially, if I look here, I've got, you know, four levels that I had to go through. Let's see what happens in each step. So I pick, again, my six is my pivot value, and what I do is I track the position where the, so, so I'm dividing, the, the, the clever thing about quicksort is it has this way of dividing the array uh, that goes one value at a time. So essentially I look at each value in the array and I say, does that value belong before the pivot or after the pivot? If the value belongs before the pivot, I'm, I keep track of how big the space, how many values that I need to store before the pivot, right? If I find a value that's smaller than the pivot, I need to make that area one, you know, one value larger. And then what I'm gonna do, which is clever, is I'm gonna do a swap, right? So I'm gonna take the value that's in the current pivot position, um, and I'm gonna swap it with the smaller value. And that allows the smaller value to end up in the right spot. All right, so let's just watch how this works, okay? So I look at five. I say, is five, um, is five greater than six? Sorry, is five less than six? The answer is yes. Okay, so I'm gonna make the pivot um, space one bigger, okay? Now I'm gonna look at seven. Is seven, um, is seven greater than, uh, less than six? The answer is no, right? And right now my, the, the current, so essentially what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna swap seven with itself. You guys will see this in a minute when we implement it, but there's nothing to show on the slide, okay? But I also don't make the space that they need to store smaller values any bigger because seven isn't small. So now you'll get a better chance to see what happens. So now I have a value three, okay? Three is smaller than the pivot value, so it belongs to the left of the pivot. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna swap it with seven, and I'm gonna increase the size of the area that stores the values that are smaller than six, okay? So you'll see by swapping it with seven, I moved it into the part of the array that's gonna store the values that are smaller than the pivot value, in this case six, okay? So now I'm gonna go on, all right? So I'm looking at four. Four is also smaller than six, so I'm gonna swap it with seven, and I'm gonna increase the size of the 
area that stores the values that are smaller than the pivot. So keep going here. I see 11. 11 is bigger than 6. So I don't do anything. I just move on. Now I look at 8. 8 is bigger than 6, so 8 stays put. Now I look at negative 1. Negative 1 is smaller than 6, so I swap negative 1 with 7, and now I increase the size of the area that stores the, pit, the values that are smaller than the pivot. Okay? So now I'm almost done. All right? I've made my pass through the array, and the only thing that's left to do is get the pivot value into the right spot. But I know where to put it, right? So the value at the very end of the range that I'm using to store values smaller than the pivot is the right place for it. So essentially, I'm going to swap negative 1 with 6. And now I'm done. It's kind of like this, the quick sort's kind of magical, right? Um, all right, so now what you'll see is that I've got 6 in the right spot. Everything to the right of 6 is bigger, everything to the left well, greater than or equal to, there's no duplicates in this array, everything to the left is small. Okay? Any questions about this? Again, this is, this is some. I have implemented QuickSort a bunch of times, and I always have to think it through kind of exactly what's happening. Right? All right. So, let's give, let's give it, this a try to implement, all right? So what we're going to do here, we're actually not going to implement quicksort today. What we're going to do is we're going to implement the partition function, because this is the fun part, all right? So the way I've set this up is that our partition function takes an input array and a start and an end position. And the reason I did it this way is because when you guys implement this on the homework, you're going to use the start and the end to target smaller parts of the array so that you can actually complete the implementation of recursive quicksort. Right? So essentially, the partition says, you know, partition this portion of the array. Right? When you implement quicksort, you start to partition smaller and smaller pieces. For now, we're just going to try to partition the whole thing and make sure that works. Right? So you'll see that I'm calling partition with this test array, and I'm partitioning the whole thing from zero to the end. Okay. So the first thing I want to do is I want to I want to test my bounds. Okay? If I'm, you know, if you're asking me to partition a, a array that's too small, then I don't want to do anything. I should just return, okay? So essentially, if end is less than or equal to start plus one, then I'm gonna return. What this is checking is to make sure, like, if start and end are the same, I shouldn't partition. And end is non-inclusive, right? Um, so here I'm going from uh, start to, to test array dot length, zero to test array dot length. So if, if you ask me to partition a value, an array that has no values, I'm going to return immediately. And if you ask me to partition an array that has one value, I'm also going to return. In every other case, I actually do need to do the partition. Okay. So now here what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose the pivot value to be the first element in the part of the array you asked me to partition. So I'm going to save this because I'm going to use this throughout my algorithm. I'm going to say I'm going to take the first value in the array. And I also need to save the pivot position. So my pivot position starts at start. My pivot value starts as the value that's stored in the first slot. When I'm done, I want that value to be in the right place, and I want all the values to the right of it to be greater than or equal to it, and all the values to the left to be less, right? So now I'm going to go through the array. And this is just kind of a standard, um, well, actually, I'm going to go through the array starting with start plus one, right? I don't need to consider the pivot value. We'll put it into the right spot at the very end. So I'm starting at I, I'm going to go through end. So I'm looping through the portion of the array that I'm working on. And so now what I'm doing is I'm saying if the value in the array at this position is less than the pivot value. Okay? So if the current value is less than the pivot value, then I, then I need to do two things. I need to make the part of the array that stores the values that are smaller than the pivot larger by adjusting the pivot position, and I need to move this value into the right place. And I do that by swapping it with what's at whatever in the current pivot position. All right, so two things to do, right? 
The first one is increase the pivot position by one. And the second one is I'm just going to do my standard swap here. So I'm going to say uh, use a temporary variable to store the current value of input array i. I'm going to set this to whatever is in the current pivot position. And then I'm going to set to be temp, my temp value. OK? All right, so again, I did two things here. I made space below the pivot for this new value, and then I swapped it into the right place in the array. OK. So when I'm done, I get to the bottom here. Remember, if we go back to look at our diagram, there was one, if I can get back, I think I can. Yeah, here we go. There was this one last step, which is when I get to the end of the array, I still need to put the pivot. So here is what things look like when I got to the end of the array, and I'm close to being done, except there's one value that's in the wrong spot, and it's the pivot value, okay? And the way I get the pivot value into the right place is I swap it with the same value that I would have swapped next. So in this case, it's negative one. In our case, it's gonna be whatever is in, in the, the pivot position, all right? And the nice thing here is because I've saved the pivot value, I don't need to use another temporary variable. Right? So I'm moving the value from that's currently in the pivot position to the start, which is where I got my pivot value from. And then I set input array pivot position equal to pivot value. Okay? So the pivot value has found its way into the right spot. And again, I don't need a temporary variable here because I essentially already stored pivot value into a temporary variable at the top of the loop because I needed it inside the loop to compare against every value in the array. All right, you feeling lucky? Let's see if this works. All right. Okay, so that looks right to me. Um, so let's think about what happened here. So eight is the pivot value. I'm choosing, I'm, try, I'm pivoting the entire array. I'm partitioning the entire array, sorry. Um, I use the first value as the pivot, that's eight. So when I'm done, there's two things I need to check. One is, are all the values to the right of eight greater than or equal to eight? And that's, in, the, in this case, that's true, it's just 11. Are all the values to the left smaller? And in this case, that's also true, right? Let's try some other inputs here, just to make sure that um, things are working as we expect. Let's try four, okay? So now things are a little, uh, a little tri a little trickier to interpret because there's two fours. Right? So the question is, which one is the pivot value when we're finished? And so what I'll do here, because if you look at the, f let's say I look at this four, I say, well, everything to the right is greater than or equal to, but five and four are not less than four, right? So it kind of depends in this case which one of the fours is the correct pivot value. So let's print the pivot position before the function returns. out. All right. So the pivot position is index two. Okay, so that's good because if I look at this four, are all the values to the right of the pivot greater than or equal to the pivot value? The answer is yes. Are all the values to the left of the pivot less than the pivot value, strictly less than the answer is yes. Okay. Um, so let's make sure that we can handle a couple of other corner cases. Let's try where the smallest value is the the first one, that works. Let's try the case where um, the largest value is the first one, that also works. Okay, so I think this works. Questions about this? You know, again, as far as the code that we've looked at together this semester, this is probably one of the subtler pieces of, you know, imperative programming that we've done. A couple of different indices to keep track of, you know, uh, et cetera. Okay, so as promised, we're actually not going to implement QuickSort today. I'm gonna let you guys do that on the homework, but let's think about its performance. Okay, so first of all, who can, who can tell me what the runtime is to do a partition? All right, so this partition function, who tell, do the, can someone do the complexity analysis for me? How long is this gonna take? 
O N, where N is? Yeah, so, well, it's a number of values in the part of the array that I'm partitioning, right? So O N, where N is like N minus start, right? So if I partition an array with one value, I get one O one. If I partition an array with 30 values, I get O three. So this is O N, right, in the size of, in the size of the part of the array that I'm partitioning, okay? And the reason is that I've got a loop in there, right? So I've got a loop that starts at line nine. That loop does not have any break statements or continue statements. Unlike insertion sorts, this is important to understand, I cannot put a break in there. Because if I do, um, I'm gonna stop too soon. I actually have to go through the entire array because it's possible that the last value is actually smaller than the pivot and needs to be put in the right spot. So I can't, uh, uh, quick sort can't assume anything about the values in the array, and so there's no way for me to stop early. I'm always gonna have to go through the entire array. Okay, so this is O N. Here's where quick sort gets fun. Right, I promise you it'd be fun. Let's imagine, okay, let's imagine that the pivot value that we choose in every step is such that the array is divided into two equal parts, okay? Now remember, merge sort, we always divided the array into two equal parts. That's how we get the log n uh, runtime in merge sort. But quick sort doesn't guarantee that the array is actually gonna be divided in half, okay? It picks a pivot value and then it moves all the values in the right spot with respect to the pivot, but it's possible that the pivot is the largest value or it's possible the pivot is the smallest value. But let's just imagine that we choose a pivot that divides the array evenly. At that point, this analysis looks identical to merge sort, okay? My first partition, now the, the only thing that's cool about this is that quick sort actually works on the way down. Quick sort actually is sorting the array as it descends to the base case. Every time it partitions the array in order to continue, it's actually accomplished a little bit of the sorting task. But let's imagine we have a array of size eight. My first partition divides the array into two arrays of size four. Now, I know this isn't exactly right because technically it's like one array of size three and one array of size four and the pivot value, but just ignore that for now. That's, that's not important, right? My second partition takes those two smaller arrays and divides them into uh, four arrays of size two, and my final partition takes four arrays of size two. Again, I know, I know it would be like one array of size one and a pivot value um, into eight arrays of size one, and I'm done because my base case is the same. Um, if you go back and look at the partition function that we just wrote, when I get to a case where you're asking me to partition a part of the array that's either empty or only contains one value, I just return, I'm done. I don't need to partition that. Okay, so if the pivot value divides the array properly, then I get this nice performance. However, here's the problem. The problem is that, like I said, there's no guarantee that quick sort is actually going to pick a pivot value that works this well, all right? So let's imagine the following. So let me go back and let's, uh, let's actually instrument our, the code that we wrote back here, okay? Um, well, actually, you know what? Let's, let's just look at it, right? Okay, so let's imagine that, you know, I, so, so here's what can happen if I choose a value that's the maximum value, okay? Well, let's choose a value that's in the middle. What's a good middle value, like six, okay. So if I happen to choose six as my pivot value, what I end up with when I'm done is one array of size three and one array of size four. So I've made the problem about half as small. That's good, okay? But if I choose a value like 12, then what's happened here? Okay, I started off needing to sort an array of size eight. What's the size of the array I have to sort now? Seven. Didn't, I didn't really get much work done here, right? If I only sort one value at a time, how many steps is this gonna take? If my partition creates two arrays about the same size that are, that, uh, that I can continue to partition, then I get log n steps. 
but if I choose a bad partition value, then here's what happens. So my first partition partitions the array into two arrays, one of size seven and the partition value, which is already sorted. My second partition partitions the array into two arrays again, one of size six and size one. My third step takes this array of size six and partitions it, um, and this keeps going and going and going. I'm not gonna finish until I've partitioned the array eight times, right? So now, worst case performance for quicksort is n squared. Remember insertion sort? Basically what we're doing is kind of a, a dressed up version of insertion sort. We're only moving one value into the right spot every time, and the problem is only getting one, uh, one unit small, okay? Any questions about this? So this is, this is, this is the bad case for quicksort, right? And again, you know, so here, you know, here's, ah, and here's the other thing about this. Look at the data in this array. What's true about this data? Like, we would kind of like to get good performance in this case. Why? Yeah. It's already sorted. And actually, if you have quick sort, pick the last value in the partition, you get this behavior if the, va if the array is already sorted in ascending order, okay? We, you guys have already wrote code to check if an array is sorted. That takes O n. Quick sort is now going to take O n squared to sort an array of values that are already sorted, right? So this is awful, right? And this is essentially how this would work, right? This is if it's sorted in descending order and I'm picking the first value, but this looks identical if it's sorted in ascending order and I pick the last value in the partition, right? So again, this just is, this is really, really tedious. All right, so understanding this, what do we do? Well, when we implement uh, quicksort, we try, to, we try to choose a good pivot value, all right? We try to choose a pivot value that's not going to lead to this type of, um, you know, pathological behavior, right? So, so the first, and again, the first and the last values are typically bad, okay? So the first value will fail if the array is sorted in reverse. The last value will fail if the array is already sorted in ascending order, which is terrible. Let me ask a question, though. What is the value that we want to pick? If you didn't know anything about the array, you want the value that partitions the array into two equal pieces. Any of you that have taken any statistics, there's a special name for this value. Yeah. It's called the median. Okay, so I feel like we have just had this incredible breakthrough as a class. We have found the ideal way to implement quicksort. I don't know why anyone hasn't thought of this before, but let's just choose the median value in the array to partition the array, and then we know that it's going to get, I'm gonna get two equal sized pieces. Why doesn't that work? This sounds like, it sounds like a fantastic idea, right? Like, I think this is, this is incredible. Right? I mean, I'm gonna win a Turing award, yeah. Yeah. How do you find the median? Sort the array, pick the value that's in the middle, right? So I can't identify the median without sorted data. It's one of the many things that sorting gets you. We talked about the fact that sorting is powerful. Once I sort an array, I can very easily compute basic statistics on it, max, min, median, things like that, quartiles, you know. Um, just based on the position. So I can't choose the median because in order to do so, I'd have to solve the problem that I'm trying to solve, all right? Um, what I can do, however, you'll see that the median is on this slide. So what actual quicksort implementations will do is they'll do one of two things. Either they pick a random value, so they pick a, ran a value randomly from the array and use that as the pivot, or if they wanna do a little bit more work to ho in hopes of avoiding this kind of nasty case, they choose like three values and pick the median of the three, right? That, that can work a little bit better. You can find exhaustive analysis on all this stuff online, right? Uh, in terms of people running this on different data sets or comparing different choices of um, pivot selection and stuff like that, right? This is a, a pretty well-studied problem. All right, so now let's put our scores for quicksort up on the big board and see where we are, right? So 
Um, best case time complexity is O n log n. All right, and that's in the case where I'm creating equal size arrays every time I perform a partition. The worst case is O n squared, and the average case, again, really depends on your data, all right? Over random data, the randomness within the data helps you, you're such a picking random pivot values, you get something that's close to n log n, all right? The problem with quicksort that makes people nervous are these pathological cases where I end up with n squared. That's, that's pretty terrible. How, th so here's the thing that's good about quicksort, and I don't actually want to get into why it's log n as opposed to something else, but you can do quicksort with a lot less space than merge store. This is one of the reasons why people like quicksort. It's one of the reasons why it got attention in the first place, was that, um, remember, merge sort needed a whole O n space. If you have a trillion values, I need a trillion more slots in memory in order to perform merge sort. Quicksort, log n, okay? It's actually a, a constant number per level, right? But the levels depends on log n, okay? So that's pretty nice, right? So in the case that quicksort works well, it can be done with a lot less space than merge sort. The variable behavior is what's tricky. So now let's go back and think about um, looking at comparing some of the sorting elements we've already talked about. So we've talked about insertion sort, we've talked about merge sort, we've talked about um, quick sort. So for insertion sort, the best case is that the data is already sorted. In that case, insertion sort will complete an ON, right? Because it will identify right away that the data is already sorted. In the worst case, if the data is sorted backwards, every single value has to be moved all the way across the array, and I get ON squared, right? Merge sort does not care what your data looks like. And again, this is an appealing property of it for certain uses. Quick sort, best case turns out to be on random data. Uh, the worst case can be sorted in one direction or the other, right? Um, it, it sort of, it depends on the implementation. All right, so let's put everything up there just to do a comparison here. So best case for insertion sort, um, you know, best worst and average case for all these algorithms. Now, there's one thing I want to point out here, which is interesting, right? We spent a little bit more time talking about merge sort and quick sort, mainly because they're fun to talk about. They also achieve optimal performance. You should never choose a sorting algorithm that performs worse than O n log n in the worst case. It doesn't have to. It's just a broken algorithm. Insertion sort does. So you might think, why are we even talking about insertion sort? Why is it on this slide? Well, here's the thing that's nice about insertion sort. For sorted data, it actually performs quite well. It's the only one on this slide that actually can get down to O n in the best case, right? Space usage, insertion sort, very little. Uh, quick sort, and that's O n log n. That's because of the recursive calls it has to make. Every step, every partition only needs a constant amount of space, but I end up having to do log n partitions. All right. So. This is one of those cases, you know, in your career as a computer scientist where you're faced with trade-offs about how to choose an algorithm, right? Um, in a minute, we're gonna talk about the, uh, very briefly, about sort of the modern sorting algorithm that's used by a number of different uh, standard libraries for languages like Java and Python. Um, and that, that algorithm is based on some of the algorithms we've already talked about, but it tries to make careful trade-offs in terms of how it uses them, right? So it turns out if you have a small array, insertion sort can actually perform faster. It doesn't have as much setup time. Um, if you want really predictable performance, merge sort um, requires a lot of space, but gets this for you. Um, if you're really short on space, quick sort is a good option. Okay. I'm gonna skip the part on sorting. Well, let me do this really quickly. So um, there's a property of sorting algorithms that we sometimes want to preserve, which is called stability. I'm gonna say 10 seconds worth about this. Um, in stable sorts, two items in the array that have the same value end up in the same order that they were in the original array, okay? In an unstable sort, two items of the same value can end up in different positions, okay? When you're sorting integers, you may think, why does this matter? But it turns out when you're sorting objects based on some key, sometimes you wanna sort things twice. So I wanna sort first by person. In this case, I might wanna sort people first by their age and then by their name. And so what I would get, for every name, I get a list in ascending order of the people with that name from uh, youngest to oldest, right? Um, 
And so the way I would do this, I was to sort by name and I would sort by age. If my sort is unstable, then what happens is this second sort will mess up the results from the first sort, right? So the second sort will move things around, um, in a way that I don't preserve the sorting based on the name field. Okay. Let me spend two minutes talking about Tim sorts. Tim sorts kind of cool, right? So this is, now all the sorting algorithms we've talked about, we're talking about to help you learn, right? These are sorting algorithms that are, um, valuable to understand from an algorithmic perspective, even if they're not used that very much in the wild. So in 2002, 2003, um, somebody added a sorting algorithm called, called Tim sort to Python, all right? Um, and this is now the default sorting algorithm used by Python and now Java. And so one of the ways to think about Tim sort is the following, okay? Well, first of all, Tim sort is, is very complicated. I am not going to try to explain how it works, all right? I knew, I do know some of the design principles behind it, okay? But here's a common thing that people do with data. Let's say I have some sorted data in one array, and I have some sorted data in the other array. I, I essentially append all the data from the second array into the first array, and then I sort it, okay? So essentially what I have is I have a bunch of sorted data followed by a bunch of sorted data. So how much time should it take to sort that array? Let's say I knew where those sorted parts of the array were, right? Remember, this was a building block that we used to implement another algorithm, right? We called this step one. If I have two sorted arrays, how long does it take to combine them together? Anybody remember? A when, it's merge, right? We implemented merge, right? Just, so what, what Tim sort tries to do is it tries to identify what it calls runs. Runs are portions of the data that you gave it that are already sorted. So if you give it on values, and it can figure out that the first half is sorted and the second half is also sorted, then it can combine them together in on time. And remember that it, what was, how, so if I give you n values, how long does it take you to figure out if they're sorted or not? That algorithm, if I give you an array with n values and all I want to know is are they sorted or not, that algorithm takes how long? What's that? O n, yeah. So it takes O n to figure out if something is sorted and it takes O n to merge things together. And so essentially, again, what Tim sort tries to do is it says, look, in the wild, people don't, people don't sort arrays that have random values. They sort arrays that have data that's already mostly sorted. So if I can identify those parts that are sorted and just merge them together, I can get much, much better performance. And internally, it actually uses both a combination of bits of insertion sort to do small parts, and then also merge sort to do larger pieces, right? So it's actually, this is a pretty clever algorithm. And, and again, this is an example of a sort that's called adaptive, meaning that it's going to choose a strategy to sort the data based on features of the data that it detects at runtime. Okay, cool. Um, this is a really cool, I mean, I'll, some of you have probably already seen this already. Hopefully somebody will repost this to the forum later. This is a fun, um, this is a fun YouTube video showing you sorting algorithms, uh, you know, as they run. I think it has a little soundtrack to it. It's kind of fun. Um, so I would encourage you to check this out. Otherwise, we are done for the day. Um, this week, only I'm gonna do office hours on Friday from one to three, so no office hours today. Um, I will see you guys on Friday. Have a great, enjoy the next couple homework problems.